Coming up in the morning edition, efforts being made in the fight against COVID-19 as the Bahamas is seeing record low numbers. And if individuals refuse to understand that it starts first with them, uh, then we have to do what we need to do. A clarion call sent out to those engaging in social gatherings. And it's Women's Week with a focus on gender-based violence. In our communities, we're seeing more and more violence taking place as a result of the pandemic, the loss of income. So we've got those stories and more when the morning edition comes. We'll be right back. It's more than just our name, more than just our achievements. It's our nature, and it's where we put our customers. At Bahamas First, we've refreshed our look, but our nature remains the same. We design insurance solutions that protect our customers from life's uncertainties, whatever they may be. We equip you for the future so that you can recover stronger. Bahamas First, what's first for you comes first for us. The We Buy You Sell family wants to show you just how thankful we are for you. Catch 50% off with our Black Friday sale on Friday, November 27th. But here's the catch. The sale will run from 12 a.m. to 12 p.m. noon. A short but reasonable window to catch a sweet deal on all of your home and hardware needs. Go to our website, wbusbahamas.com, for a quick and easy three-step process. Browse the gallery and select your item. Add to cart. And step three, check out. We'll see you there. everyone, I'm LaDawn Davis. You're looking at a live shot on the outside as we wake up to partly cloudy conditions. Expect cool weather as a cold front is approaching the northwestern islands. In all areas, weather cloudy and warm with isolated showers or thunderstorms today. So you may want to pull out the umbrella just in case. We now head on out to our streets where Lloyd Allen and the Morning Edition traffic team standing by with your Monday traffic commute. The traffic report is sponsored by Bahamas First. First in insurance, today, tomorrow. Yes, good morning, LaDon. Good morning, Bahamas. This is a start to your Monday morning, and of course, we're giving you your first look at traffic. By the way, LaDon, we've missed you for a while. I know you are on vacation. It's great to have you back. This morning, your traffic report is coming from the intersection of University Drive and University Commons. If you are familiar with this area, you know that traffic tends to build around the 8, 9 o'clock hour, and so it's a little heavy at this time. However, if you do need to utilize this area, you should be able to do so nice and smoothly with a slight delay. Also, we're, rem we're rem reminding drivers, rather, that in the areas of Fox Hill Road South, Faith Avenue South, and other areas around town, roadworks continue, and so you definitely want to drive with caution and with care. This morning, we're also joined by Sergeant Crestonia Johnson from the Royal Bahamas Police Force Traffic Division, giving you an initial look at weekend traffic. Hello, Plaza, good morning to you, and a Plaza, good morning, Bahamas. Over the weekend period, we've had a total of 21 accidents involving damage, six accidents involving injury, and three hit and run accidents. There are still eight persons who remain hospitalized as a result of being involved in a traffic accident. Well, uh, sounds like some positive news coming in there. Officer Johnson, we also spoke this morning about some do's and don'ts in high traffic zones. What do you have to say? Usually, we always mention the distracted driving. But one thing that is commonly done but, but not usually mentioned is indecisive driving. Indecisive driving leads to a number of accidents and a number of traffic incidents. Indecisive driving is when sometimes, if you say if you're on a roundabout and a driver is, is traveling but is in a particular direction and, and suddenly decides to go in, in the opposite direction, that then gives mixed signals to drivers, hence causing accidents. So as a result of this, indecisive driving is... A, at, on the top of those matters that cause, cause serious incidents on the street. So as much as possible, again, advising the general public to continue to practice safe driving, safe driving practices. When you're on the street, pay attention. If you're traveling within a particular area, you utilize your signals. And then when you're traveling, make sure you know where it is that you want to go. 
All right, so definitely hoping that that information gets you started nice and safely to your destination for the week ahead. That's been a quick look at your Monday morning traffic report for the morning edition. Lloyd Allen, ZNS Network News. Now off the top this morning for the second week now, COVID-19 cases are trending down. The latest figures showing 18 new cases, 10 of them here in New Providence, three over in Grand Bahama, three in Exuma, one in Abaco, and another in Andros. Hospitalizations are also down significantly with only 21 patients being treated in Grand Bahama and New Providence. While the COVID numbers are going down, many persons are still participating in large social gatherings. However, Minister of National Security, the Honorable Marvin Dames, mincing no words when it comes to prosecuting those found in breach of the emergency orders. We are expending a tremendous amount of police resources and, and, and you know, managing person's behavior. It's just last night, you know, shutting down clubs and parties where people are not wearing masks. And, and you know, we keep saying is that we don't want to get there, but if we have to, we will. And we will use every extent of the law to ensure that people understand that we're serious. Meantime, the Bahamas will be working closely with the World Health Organization on any approved vaccine for the coronavirus. So far, Pfizer and, Mod and Moderna rather, vaccines have emerged as front runners in the medical community. Local COVID-19 task force member and director of the National HIV and AIDS program, Dr. Nakia Forbes, is sharing her views on the two vaccines. Good information in terms of these vaccines available from Pfizer and Moderna. They both performed very well. That we heard the Pfizer vaccine overall worked, it had an efficacy of 90%, and then in some populations up to 94%. And Moderna's vaccine also performed quite well at about 94.5%, very close to 95% efficacy. So that's great news in terms of the world of prevention and COVID vaccines. The Bahamas mourning the loss of another Bahamian icon, well-known well psychologist, Dr. Timothy McCartney, died in Florida on Saturday. Dr. McCartney, also an organizational development consultant, was the first Bahamian to obtain a doctorate in psychology. He was employed by the Ministry of Health to establish the first department of psychology in the country at the Sunderland's Rehabilitation Center, which was last named honored in his honor. Dr. McCartney spent the latter part of his life in Florida, where he served as a professor at the Wayne High Singer Graduate School of Business and Entrepreneurship at Nova Southeastern University. Condolences already being issued to Dr. McCartney's family. Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Dr. Hubert Minnis, described the late Dr. Timothy McCartney as a generous, kind-hearted man who excelled as a teacher and as a counselor. Prime Minister Minnis said Dr. McCartney was a deeply spiritual and creative individual who dedicated his life to the well-being and enrichment of his family, friends, clients and colleagues. The Free National Movement Party also issuing a statement of condolences to the family of the late Dr. Timothy McCartney, describing him as an example of hard work and who is leaving behind a stellar record of service and sacrifice to country. Meanwhile, Progressive Liberal Party leader Philip Davis also sending condolences to the McCartney family, remembering him as a trailblazer in his field and a Bahamian ambassador of excellence. Stay close, we've got more right after this. You're watching The Morning Edition. We're here to help you. We're here to hold your hand. We're here to support you. I think it's everyone who sacrifices their life to serve the needs of others are all heroes. So we all just kind of get together and do what's right for our patients. The human connection is what bonds all of us. I'm truly and proud to be part of the Pineapple family. What matters most is your health. Be proactive about it. Guess who's back? Yours truly on the OT. Starting Monday, November 9th at 9 a.m. on 1540 a.m., 104.5 FM, and on the ZNS Television Network. 
starting once again November 9th. We'll be going Mondays and Wednesdays. We may be in COVID, but nothing stops this show. The OT is back. Welcome back to the Morning Edition. This week is Women's Week with a focus on a number of issues affecting women in this country, among them political and economic empowerment. Also, a global issue affecting women remains on the doorstep of our country and is said to be on the rise. Gender-based violence now reaching alarming figures with local organizations and women's groups calling for action at various levels. Here's Betty Thompson-Moss. Gender-based violence remains a prevalent issue in societies around the world. In the Bahamas, statistics are showing an upswing in abuse. Over the past seven to eight months, there were 126 new cases. This is alarming because in past years, this number has tripled. There is great concern for gender-based violence in our country. As people are being affected in their personal lives, as well as in their homes. Marissa Mason-Smith is a member of the Women's Advisory Council and the National Chairperson for Zanta Advocacy Committee. She feels the pandemic has certainly contributed to the escalation in cases. In our communities, we're seeing more and more violence taking place. As a result of the pandemic, loss of income, there's a lot of challenges that are being faced by families today. We have also seen now that in most recent times, um, the, the murders that are taking place in our country, most recently, we have had a mother and a daughter who was killed. We've had children killed. We've had men killed. So gender-based violence does not just focus on women, but it focuses on people in general. With such a wide impact, the questions facing local advocacy groups, how to resolve conflict and to what degree can help be provided. And so during the next 16 days of activism, as declared by the United Nations, the Zonta Club of the Bahamas will be hosting several initiatives. In particular, we are hosting uh, educational forums, women empowerment sessions, and so we're highlighting uh, the need to say no to violence in all its forms. We're providing educational opportunities, job readiness programs for women who are unemployable and who are unemployed and giving them the necessary skills that are necessary. While skills and training are necessary, there's also the need for tighter laws to help curb gender-based violence. A resolution was signed by NGOs saying that we need to have stiffer laws and greater penalties for perpetrators. And we started the work, and at this point, due to the pandemic, we have not been able to escalate that work. But it is actively being pursued, and we anticipate that by early next year, we should have some draft, and the bill should be presented to Parliament. Um, we do believe that we have enough evidence and support to demonstrate why we need to have stiffer penalties and our laws need to be strengthened. With legislation still pending, community education will pump up this year with a special focus on Nassau Village, the site of several gender-based violent activities. We're going to be the tying of the bulls, first and foremost, on the corner and of Nassau Village as well as through the community, which highlights that we say no to violence in all its forms. Again, we are offering training programs for the women in the community to help upgrade them and to, to standardize their life and their living. We're also going to be having several town hall meetings with the youth, with the church, with women's health issues, because we've also realized that this pandemic has affected women's health women are stressed men are stressed children are stressed and so we're, we're going to provide tips on how to survive all of this and so the fight is on to not only survive the pandemic but to reduce a form of violence affecting one out of every three women in our society for the morning edition i'm betty thompson moss 
Thanks a lot, Betty. Well, meantime, the Department of Social Services has been reaching out to a number of individuals seeking help. Most of the assistance has been virtual means. Social Services Counselor Jeanette Minnis shares the experience. What we've been doing is actually we've been doing virtual counseling, so they contact us via phone and um, we set up Zoom sessions and so we meet with them in that capacity. For our victims of domestic violence, we have to bring them in so we can find them places of shelter and get them to a place of safety um, and then we do their counseling virtually as well. We have, um, we do marital counseling, so you have couples who are um, having challenges. We do grief counseling. Um, we have parents who are having issues with their children, so we try to work with family counseling as well. So we have a myriad of issues that we try and deal with um, and help people to get to a place. A lot of it is basically communication um, and building up effective communication skills and learning how to deal with conflict. Well, like we said earlier, it's National Women's Week, and all week long we will be featuring the stories of women performing well in a man's world. This morning, Charles Fisher introduces us to a young lady who is bringing the flame. Her name is Precious Maki. She is a steel fabricator slash welder. She works out of CNS Building Supplies on East Street South. How she got into this field was not just a flick of the torch. This is my parents' place, so I've been doing this from a little, little girl. Whenever I come home from school, my daddy would just tell me to take off my skirt and help pick up the steel in the yard. And from then, I just noticed what I like to do. I used to weld, tie them steel, steel fabricated, whatever it is to do with steel, I just like doing it with steel. It's real hands-on work. Something that really gets your hands dirty. No manicures in this kind of job. It's a good job. I like hands-on work. And as a female, I don't think, you know, we get so used to being so laid back and waiting on things up. And I like to go there and work. I like to bring home something, too. I just like to work. I got three brothers. They in the field, but they not stay with the old man. So it was only me or the girls. It's only me who decided to do the construction work with him and stay inside the field. So what was her dream job as a child? I used to say I want to be a police, but that changed a long time ago. I, I stopped that for my husband five. So that's all I know how to do. I love to do it my old man is too. I guess I just wanted a tomboy. My mommy worked here as well. So it was her thing too. She ain't never had no next job. My mommy worked here. She is tie steel and do stuff as well when back in the day. She considers herself a steel fabricator lover. Steel fabricator is like, it's just like you say, it's um, we fabricate steel. I mostly tie car columns and bell cars. The beams will go in the starting up from the foundation, go up to the roof. Steel fabricator And no doubt about it, she loves what she is doing. I love it. It's good. You know, you got your up days, your down days, but all together is good. You thank God for life and thank God for what comes. On Tuesday, we will speak with two female electricians. For the Morning Edition, I'm Charles Fisher. Great story there, Fisher. Thanks a lot. Well, Lloyd Allen takes a look at the music community and how it's being impacted by COVID-19. This year, the NASA Music Society has been, uh, like many organizations across the country, affected by COVID-19, forcing you to resort to many virtual means of connection. But moving forward this year, a big part of your operations has been your scholarship program. So normally it's a big part of our, our season and our mission, but the audience usually becomes aware of the scholarships at the end of the process, and they learn about the scholarship recipients. Sometimes they'll hear them perform, etc. But this season, we're really putting them more on the forefront, and we're actually having an audience participate in the selection of some of the candidates. So, of course, as you said, audience have not been at this level of the competition. What can we expect to see? Well, we have um, several competitions. One we've already offered and awarded, and that's our Education Technology Awards. And the ones the audience have um, a chance to look forward to are a violin and guitar competition. And that, that will be in February, the final round. And, and then we have a composition award, which is something new that we're doing. And we're partnering with the BNT, the Bahamas National Trust. So the audience will also have an opportunity to look at the three finalists for that as well. You mentioned the finalists, but all together, how many contestants are we looking at uh, from start? Well, we're hoping for a good turnout. And we, don't, we won't know until the, the deadline, which is in December. 
December for the guitar and violin, and January for the composition. The guitar and the violin competitions, they each win an instrument, the top prize. And then we also have the Audience Choice Award. And they'll also have the opportunity to interact with these world famous judges and um, do some networking with them, get the opportunity to work with them, get coached by them. And the Composition Award is some music software that will enable the composer to really hone their craft. Talk to us about some of those persons coming in to assist this year. Yeah, we're, we're really excited um, on two, two fronts in that our entire season, once we are able to have live music, will be all Bahamian performers. So that's a first for us. We're really excited to promote all of the talent found in the Bahamas. And the second part is the international panel of judges we put together. So for each of these competitions, we have very esteemed panel of judges from all around the globe. All right, sounds like some great uh, progress there. Definitely looking forward to the final details of this initiative. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you so much. Lloyd Allen, ZNS, Network News. Thanks a lot, Lloyd. And we are live with the disabled community. That story and more when the morning edition comes. We're right back. The natural resources of the Bahamas play a critical role in supporting Bahamian livelihoods. For example, the fishing and tourism industry, which include fishermen, seafood exporters, hoteliers, dive operators, restaurants, and others. Collectively, they generate approximately $1.5 billion a year. Therefore, we must respect and preserve what we have. These resources belong to us. This is my livelihood. This is my livelihood. This is my livelihood. So let's all do our part to maintain our local economy and a good quality of life. Remember, if we take care of nature, nature will take care of us. Praise the Lord, the Lord. Friends, family and Asta Goompa. Friends, family and Asta Goompa. I've been poor my entire life. I am the last of 15 children. And I don't know what it is to have a new pair of shoes, a new dress. I always got hand-me-downs, hand-me-downs. And dinner and meals, thank God for fruit trees. Guess who's back? Yours truly on the OT. Starting Monday, November 9th at 9 a.m. on 1540 a.m., 104.5 FM, and on the ZNS Television Network. Starting once again, November 9th. We'll be going Mondays and Wednesdays. We may be in COVID, but nothing stops this show. The OT is back. Hey, long time no see. You hear me? Long time. No sea. Boiled fish, stew fish, stew conch. I love it all. Tourists come here to take our tours, experience our sun, sand, and sea, and they also spend money around town. I used to see a bunch of hogfish around here, but nowadays, I hardly see any. You protect one area, the fish do they think, make a bunch of babies that spread all over the sea. What's the problem? If we protect, certain parts of our sea, it keeps all parts working right. I was against that phrase, but knowing what I know now, I totally agree on having marine protected areas. I support marine protected areas. We support marine protected areas. Look for Bahamas Protected on Facebook. Sign the petition. Sign the petition. <laughs> Awareness Week is underway, and it certainly has not been an easy one for members of the center. Here again is Lloyd Allen. Yes, good morning again, LaDon. Good morning, Bahamas. This morning, we're at the Bahamas Red Cross Center for the Deaf. I'm speaking with the principal, Ms. Sonia Roll. Ms. Roll, welcome to the morning edition. Welcome. Thank you for having me here on the show. 
Now, uh, you're speaking with us this morning about Deaf Awareness Week, which officially starts when? And um, tell us some details. Yes. Deaf Awareness Week is a week that we've always celebrated in the Bahamas. And believe me, the, the week starts today. Today is the first day, the 23rd through the 27th. Now, beginning today, one of the audiologists in the country, one who works very closely with us, she has, she's doing screening for hearing people, okay? And that is going to be on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Friday, not Wednesday. And it will be by appointment only. Okay, her numbers are 328-8644. And she is located not far from where we are now, right in the Oaksville area. She is on Thompson Court. And um, she works very closely with the school. And what I want to entreat with you while we are talking about screening, I want any parent out there during this Deaf Awareness Week, if you know that you have a child between the ages of two and five and they're not speaking properly, okay, please contact us at the school. Okay, and we will see to it that you get some assistance for your child. It is a fact that 5% of the population in any country is affected with deafness, whether you're hard of hearing or profoundly deaf, 5%. So we know that we are not targeting all the children in this country at this time. I'm sorry, Mr. Roll, what did you say? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it is no laughing matter. Uh, this morning, we're also speaking about parents and children. Uh, we know, of course, across the board, there have been adjustments when it comes to learning, specifically to protect ourselves against COVID-19. But there have been some challenges. Mr. Allen, there has been so many challenges presently with virtual school for the deaf and hearing impaired. Um, my teachers have been doing an excellent job trying to do their, the best they can to engage our children on the virtual platform. But for many of them, it's a challenge. As a matter of fact, when we first started off this school year, many of them were out, were out devices. But the House Management Committee was able to purchase some of these devices for our students and got them started. After they got the device, Many of our students having difficulty getting on and off the platform, understanding the platform with their, with their teachers, okay? I've had a student who used to be a 4.0 um, GPA, and his mommy showed me him in the morning on video. I mean, she has to pull him out of bed, and this was a young man who was excited about school. But he just feels at this time that he is dumb. He thinks that he now has a disorder, that um, this um, COVID-19, this pandemic has given him a disorder. And here he is having to understand his education on this little screen. And it's difficult. I have some younger ones at this time, okay, and who have visual problems. They're not gaining much. They're not gaining much from virtual school. Now, those are some of the concerns, but there is some uh, good news on the horizon. Yes, there's good news on the horizon. We are meeting with the minister this week who will be talking about a facility for the deaf and hearing impaired where we will be able to take them in. The classrooms will be bigger. The, the facility doesn't need much repair as we have here at the school where we are, where both buildings are needing repair. And we will be able to do face-to-face -face with our children. This is something that we are really looking forward to, where we can actually bring them back into the classroom and do face-to-face. -face. Well, Ms. Roll, uh, just so you know, uh, your story just now was very heartfelt. Uh, that uh, 4.0 student, I'd definitely like to meet up with him at some point so we can share his story, but also encourage these students to continue to push uh, when it comes to education. Um, for you, as an educator, how long have you been in the field and what's been your most rewarding experience? Yes. I have been in this field now, Mr. Allen, for some time. As a matter of fact, it's been over 40 years. And I'm very near retirement. Retirement. 
And my rewarding experience has always been to see children move from one point to the other. Believe me, I want you to understand that um, all children can learn. This has been my mantra throughout my career, that all of them can learn. And I've seen children, no matter how impaired they've been, no matter how profoundly deaf they've been, I've seen them pass BJC examinations. I have worked through it. I've seen them pass BGCSE examinations because deaf children have a lot of cognitive ability. They just communicate differently. And so we, I have seen these success and it's these success that I will leave with, that I will cherish all of my life, for the rest of my life. Now, of course, as we wrap up, uh, I cannot let you leave without teaching me one simple, one simple uh, deaf uh, signal. Uh, teach me again. I think this is good morning. Uh, <laughs> I'm a little rusty. Said, Hi. <laughs> good morning is like this. You put the right hand to the mouth and you say, good morning. It's a good morning. Yes. And I wish for all of you that you will have a very good morning. I thank you. Thank you so much. And of course, reporting for the center from the Center of, for the Deaf for the Red Cross for the morning edition, Lloyd Allen and uh, Miss Sonia Rowe, ZNS Network News. That was a good lesson there, Lloyd. Thanks a lot. And that's a wrap for us this morning for the entire team. I'm LaDawn Davis. Make it a great day, everyone. <laughs>